Good afternoon, Year 5. Uh, you're very welcome to this afternoon's art lesson. And we're getting into a new topic now, aren't we? We're cracking on with our new half-term topic, and this will be the first kind of topic lesson we look at, actually. We are going to be learning about the Great Fire of London. Now, our chosen artist for this half-term is not directly associated, linked to the um, Great Fire of London. What he is linked to is he is linked to this time period. So our chosen artist, who I'll introduce a little bit later on, was very much alive during the Great Fire of This is his period of history. So what I thought we'd start by doing is I thought we'd start by putting this event that we're going to learn about in our history learning in much more detail in some historical context. So the Great Fire of London happened in 1666. The year now is 2020, but this happened in the year 16. 66. Okay, so that gives us some idea of how far back we're going in history. Well, what we'll do, we'll play a quick game of which came first, so that we can work out what, where the Great Fire of London would sit in relation to some other historical events. So, let's do the first one. The Great Fire of London, or the Viking Invasion of England. Which of these happened first in history? Which of these is from the furthest back? Which of these happened first? Pause the video, have a think, and choose one. Because here comes the answer. Three, two, one. The Viking invasion of England happened first. That happened in the year 800 AD. So that happened a good 1,200 years ago. Around 800 years before the Great Fire of London. So way, way on from um, the uh, Viking invasion. The Great Fire of London. Now then, which happened first here? The Great Fire of London or Victoria becomes Queen? The start of the Queen Victoria's reign, the start of the Victorian age. Which of these happened first? Have a think, pause, here comes the answer. Three, two, one. Yep, so the Great Fire of London happened first, that happened in 1666. And the uh, Victorian era was the 19th century, so between 1837 and 1901, that was the reign of Queen Victoria. Now then, let's link to our last topic, shall we? Uh, the Great Fire of London, or the building of Chichen Itza. So let's think back to that Maya history that we looked at um, in our last half term and work out which happened first. Have a think, pause the video if you want, because the answer is coming in three, two, one. Chichen Itza was built first. 900, the year 900 ish. No, known for certain, uh, was the building of Chichen Itza, and then yeah, uh, another quick mass, another seven hundred years later, random. Right, let's get a bit closer now. Let's have another artist, shall we? Let's think art. Which of these happened first? Was it the Great Fire of London or the birth of our last artist that we looked at in great detail, Vincent? No, he's not the last one actually. William Grill was the last one, wasn't he? So go back again. First half term. Uh, Vincent van Gogh, was it his birth or the Great Fire of London? Which of those do you think happened first? Have a think, pause the video. Here comes the answer. Three, two, one. Okay, well, it's Great Fire of London because um, Vincent van Gogh was closer to the Victorians that we looked at earlier. He was um, around just before uh, Queen Victoria, really, in, in around that period. Um, so 1853, he was born, and the Great Fire of as we know, 1666. Right, now it's getting really close now, okay. Which of these happened first? Great Fire of London, or Henry VIII marries his sixth wife? So Henry VIII, that famous Tudor king, who had six wives. When do we think this was? Are these getting close? Who came first, Henry VIII or the Great Fire of London? What do you think? Uh, pause the video, and uh, here comes the answer. Three, two... One. Okay, so it is the Tudors. Now we've got a gap of what about uh, 60, 60, about 120 years between them now, so reasonably close. Um, the reign of Henry the Eighth. Next one, which happened first here, the Great Fire of London or Guy Fawkes plots and fails about the House of Parliament. The Gunpowder Plot. You might know a little bit about that. When did that happen? Which of these happened first? 
Here comes the answer. Three, two, one. Well, only just it was um, the gunpowder plot and the attempted uh, killing of uh, James I, who was the king at the time, came after Elizabeth. So we had Henry VIII, didn't we? Henry VIII's daughter was Elizabeth. And then when Elizabeth died, the throne passed to her uh, cousin, um, James I, or James VI of Scotland. And the gunpowder plot happened around the same time. And then look, 60 years later, Great Fire Island. So now we've come at it from both sides. We have started with Victorians and Vikings far too far away. We came closer, Henry VIII and the Tudors and Vincent van Gogh. And then we got really close in now. We're saying it's around the time of the gunpowder plot, around the time of Guy Fawkes. Now, at the same time, as a great part of London, over the sea, in the country of the Netherlands, over in Europe, we had the Dutch Golden Age. Now, the, the word Dutch relates to people from the Netherlands. So if you are a person from the Netherlands, you're not a Netherlandish person or a Netherlander. You are Dutch. The word is Dutch. That's the word they use to describe someone from the Netherlands. So the Dutch Golden Age was a period in the history of the Netherlands, roughly spanning the era from 1588 to 1672. So, as we just looked at, that's kind of after the Tudor period in our country. Um, they had the Golden Age. And this is a time when Dutch trade, science and art and the Dutch military were among the most acclaimed in the world. Great word there, acclaimed. That means celebrated and, and praised. So the Dutch people from the Netherlands were very highly celebrated from being brilliant at science, brilliant military, lots of ships and soldiers, um, great trade, so that means they bought and sold all kinds of things from all over the world, and kind of almost most of all, they had the greatest artists of the time. Now, in the time before the year 1800, brilliant painters, the best painters in the world were known as old masters um, and they were known as kind of old masters because they were great teachers and an old master painter would have then a school of younger painters around him who would all try and paint like him he he i, I say he because they were all men um, would teach other um, students uh, how to paint in his style so one of these old masters um, who was perhaps more martial than any of the Dutch old masters was Rembrandt Harmenzoon van Rijn. But we're just going to call him Rembrandt. Okay? And that's what people refer to him as, the painter Rembrandt. And he's going to be our inspiration this half term. Um, Rembrandt was a wonderful painter and um, his artwork is among the most celebrated and prized of European art. If you wanted to buy a Rembrandt these days, I'm afraid you're not going to be able to even if you've got millions and millions of pounds, because I don't think anyone would sell you one. They are priceless. He's generally considered to be one of the, uh, the greatest painters and printmakers, because he didn't just paint, he has used etching and printmaking as well, in European art history, and probably the most important in Dutch history. His contributions to art came in a period that we call the Dutch Golden Age, like we said. After his success as a young portrait painter, a portrait is a painting of a person. A portrait is a painting of a person. So after success as a young portrait painter, he had personal tragedy and financial hardships in his later years. Yet his etchings, this is where um, you use uh, sort of scratchings on metal and then um, ink and uh, pressings on the top to create artwork and paintings were popular throughout his last lifetime and his reputation, so what other people thought of him, as an artist remained high. For 20 years he taught nearly every important Dutch painter. So, look at building up that image of Rembrandt, not just as a painter, but as a brilliant teacher. Rembrandt's greatest creative work is seen in his portraits of his contemporaries and his self-portraits. He's really famous for portraits of himself. There are many, many, many different examples. Um, and also for illustrations of scenes from the Bibles. His self-portraits are a unique biography. They tell the story of his life. You can look at all the self-portraits of Rembrandt and you can see a man's life, his development from a young man into um, old age. He surveyed himself without vanity and with the utmost sincerity. 
Now, this is a couple of great words to look at there. Without vanity. Vanity is being um, rather obsessed with the way you look and thinking about trying to look good. He painted himself without trying to make himself look what people would consider beautiful. He painted himself as a true likeness of what he saw in his reflection. And with the utmost sincerity, that means he was with the he did it with the greatest kind of care and real attention to detail to be true, to reflect that true image of what he really looked like. So he was a very sort of um, honest painter. He painted what he really saw. So let's have a look at some of Rembrandt's paintings. Here. I'd like you to pause and answer these questions. I'm just going to read them out to you. What do you notice about Rembrandt's paintings? What stands out about the way he paints? Do you see the differences to other artists we've looked at? So I'd like you to think back, right, what, what happened with Van Gogh? What were they like? What did we see in the Van Gogh paintings? What's different here? What's noticeable about, about these paintings? I'll just move myself out of the way and you can have a good look at that one. Okay, well, did you say, I'm hoping you did say, they're all about light and shadow. They're all about darkness and light. There's lots of what well, is almost black, really, really dark parts. There's lots of unseen areas. They're paintings a lot of people, and they're focused in the middle. The people are not looking at the paint, at the um, pictures in these examples, but in some ways, well, where they are. Something we notice a lot about Rembrandt is that the focus of the painting in the middle sits in the light. That sits in the um, in the shining light, and then around the outside of the painting, around the edges, we have the darker areas. There is things going on in the darkness, and the great thing about being um, in front of a real Rembrandt, which I say so I'm really lucky to have been able to, to do myself, is you see, actually, it's not black, it's not just darkness. There is this beautiful detail in the darkness, but it's just sort of, it's covered in that shadow, which makes it so sort of mysterious and, and so um, evocative, it makes you think of that, uh, that time. This is a time before electric light, where people were lit by just candles or fires, and that kind of comes across, especially in pictures like um, the one in the top left-hand corner there in the cave, or in the centre one, where the only light is coming in through that window, and there's just lots of shadow and darkness. So Rembrandt painted many famous pictures. The portraits used light and shade. Sitters are often shown in a calm or thoughtful appearance. He was such a good painter that many of his pictures made people feel as if they were taking part in what is happening. Paintings by Rembrandt can be seen in art galleries all over the world. Perhaps the most famous painting of Rembrandt's is this one here with all the um, soldiers. This is called The Night Watch. And this is one of the Rembrandts that I've seen, actually, and I saw this in the, it's in the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam. And it's an amazing painting because it's really impressive. It's huge. It's actually, it's like the size of, um, I'm trying to think, oh, do you know what? I think it's probably bigger than the knowledge box. If you made the knowledge box flat, it's probably a bit bigger than that. It's probably the size of the floor of your classroom. Probably something like that. Huge painting. And... It's this amazing picture of all these people, these soldiers, getting ready to go out on a night um, sort of expedition, a night mission. And you've got these faces just caught in the light, and then, then there's these layers and layers behind of darkness. You get this real sort of mood of, of, um, of the evening, of the dark. And then you've got this kind of mysterious um, female figure in the middle there. Wonderful painting. The Night Watch, that one. Throughout his work, Rembrandt used colour, which darkens as it approaches the edge of the painting and lights towards the centre. There's always a certain person or event or group of people that's near the centre, and they're shown to be brighter than the rest of the picture, where the dark backgrounds are not to be ignored. They're painted to be as interesting and important as the main focus. In most of his paintings, there are deep whites and blacks, which show contrast between different parts of the work. And no more so can you see this in these front two figures of the Night Watch there. You see the bright white of the man's uh, rough, the man's colour there, and the white on this man's sash and his hat, compared to the black of this uniform, the darkness around the outside. And you can see the same again um, in this painting 
um, of the woman with the book. The light shined on the book and how it reflects the bright white reflection on um, the back of her cloak there. So, uh, okay, let's go over what we've done. Let's quickly recap with some questions. I'd like you to pause the video in a moment and try and answer these questions just on some paper or on your book, whatever you've got. Okay, can you ask these five questions about Rembrandt? In which country was Rembrandt born? In which country was Rembrandt born? Where's he from? What group of painters did he belong to? Rembrandt was famous for paintings of people. What do we call a painting of a person? One of Rembrandt's most famous paintings is a scene of soldiers about to leave for an evening mission. What is this painting called? And what part of Rembrandt's paintings were usually the darkest? Which part of the painting was the darkest? Pause and have a go at answering those questions. Here come the answer. Three, two, one. Okay, so he was from the Netherlands, or sometimes we call that country Holland, but usually the Netherlands. Uh, he was from a group of painters uh, called the Old Masters. He was a Dutch old master. Or you might have said he was from the Dutch Golden Age. Either of those, I think he's okay. A painting of a person is called a portrait. Rembrandt's most famous painting is a scene of soldiers. That's called the Night Watch. And the part of Rembrandt's painting that was the darkest is the outside or the outside edges. Shall we have a little go and see if we can emulate another good word? I'm full of good words today. Emulate the master. That means to copy, to become one of his students. We're going to have a go at copying a Rembrandt eye. We're going to try and find some of that light and shadow. We're just going to use pencil. Today. And today we're not trying to create our own night watch. We are not attempting the world's masterpiece. We're having a bit of a practice and a bit of a go. All you're going to need is a pencil and a sheet of plain paper. If you haven't got lined paper and you need to, um, haven't got plain paper, all you've got is lined. That's okay. It doesn't matter. We're just having a little practice. We're just having a little go to see if we can repl replicate some of Rembrandt's skills. So we're going to use pencil to show heavy shadow and light on the eyelid and create a picture of the whole eye. You might not want to leave areas blank that you think it should be the lightest. And you can do just one eye or you could do both across the nose. You've got two different eyes that you could do. Uh, two different um, self-portraits that I've got for you here. There's this one. So you could pause the video, uh, but I will be doing a demo in a minute. So just um, just don't, just hang on for a minute. You want to come back to this bit and pause, or a slightly different one here. Um, if you could use that uh, instead. So uh, now I'll have a little go on the visualizer and show you the kind of thing you're aiming to do. Okay, so I'm all set up here. Now I've actually made a bit of a start before you join me here. I want to show you my page so far, because this is the kind of thing I'd like your page to look like. I've got lots of eyes on it. I've got a few different goes, trying different styles, trying different ways of doing it, trying some of the different eyes um, from the different self-portraits, because this is how, it, um, how art works. It's not all about trying to come up with that masterpiece straight away. You take time to practice skills, to have a go, what works and what doesn't. So personally, I've, what I've done is I've got myself set up with my um, iPad here and uh, I've got the uh, portrait that I'm going to use um, in front of me and then I'm going to zoom right in on the chosen eye I want to do. Now, I didn't say a minute ago, if you wanted to do um, a different Rembrandt self-portrait, I don't see why you couldn't um, have a Google of them, find some different Rembrandt self-portraits, and choose one that you really like and you'd like to copy. So I've got a slightly different one here, and then I'll go like that. So, before I start, I'm going to start to sort of have a really good look at it. So, this is the area that I'm going to cover here. Uh, so, the darkest part is going to be the um, pupil, the eye, so to the eye here, and the top lid. And then also... As I think of that as the darkest, the lightest is going to be the white of the eye. Between the two then, on the dark side I've got this pocket here inside, put myself in the eye, um, and the eyelid there, in there, that's quite dark, and then some of the area underneath, as well as the brow as well. Now, what I've started doing each time is I am starting with a basic eye shape, that oval shape. Now, the size is up to you. doesn't matter. You could have done yours much bigger than mine in a cross like this, a huge one. You zoomed in. Or you could just do some smaller ones like this. 
starting with that and then I'm going to bring in that lid as well so I can just see on mine in fact I'll bring this right across so you can see it here is the shape of the eye and the lid is closed slightly along there now I know that lid is going to be quite dark so I'm pressing quite heavily I'm grinding the pencil into the paper I'm pressing a little heavier there so I'd follow that line there I'm going to bring in now that dark spot of the eye now on this one particular one um, it's all dark on some of the other ones if I bring it um, up some of the other eyes we looked at such as this one here you can see how the light is reflecting in the eye now if you're doing that what you can do is find where the light is reflecting leave it blank just draw that shape and then if you cover it in and you know, I'm going nice and dark now on this part the rest of the eye you can leave that part there blank and that's now become the lightest part of the paint because we know what we leave blank will be the very lightest part anyway back to my eye got that part marked out now I know I'm going to bring in some darkness in this corner here so I'm going to mark out that area a little bit and I'm just looking to fill that in with the darkness now if you are copying if you are using skills of copying of emulating magpie I uh, would suggest your eyes should be as much on the work that you're copying as they are on your own pencil don't just look and then spend another five minutes over here keep looking back you don't have to take your pencil off the page just look back okay so i've got a line in there a bit in there as well and then bring that across like that. keep looking keep looking at the page Right, now I've got another dark patch just in here that I'm going to try and bring in now as well. Oh, probably pressed a little bit too hard there, but it doesn't matter. No such thing as a mistake really in a piece of art. Just something I learned from. Now then, that's alright as it is there. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Fill out, fill out all the dark patches. Now I've just said this and this is going to be my lightest. So that means I shouldn't see any more white. If that's my lightest, everything else should have some pencil on it. And it might be that, um, it should be that the rest of the paint, the picture here then, will have some pencil. It might be the lightest feather with the side of a pencil, just to bring in that colour difference. But if you're going to choose one area as your lightest, so in my case it was the, the white of the eye, that then means that nothing else can be as light as that. In fact, I've got another dark patch over here in mind. Do you know, I think that's the one. This is turning out, this particular one, probably to be the best of the lot that I've done today. Which is nice, because it means that sort of the practice that I've done has been worthwhile. The first one I did, honestly, year five, I did it and I thought, oh dear, I've got to teach year five how to do this. I've not done a very good job myself. But, practice brings the best. So there we are. Not quite finished with that. I'll probably continue and try and blend in so the shadows can be a bit darker in a minute. But I blend those hands forget. Have a go at some different eyes then. Um, as I said, if you wanted to bring both of them in together, then you could bring in the nose here um, and then carry on the second eye uh, if you wanted. It's up to you. Have a little go at trying to emulate our master artist this half term, Rembrandt, and I'll see you next time for some more home learning.